Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's certainly a pleasure and a privilege to be able to gather together and to join our hearts in these beautiful songs of praise to the Lord. I'm so grateful to have that opportunity to be here, and, and I marvel at the talent that Brother Stevens has and how he's able to lead us and, and even to write melodies for songs and words for songs. He's done that as well. We're blessed to have him in our generation of time. We're thankful to have visitors in our audience, and I know some of you were not here yesterday, but those who were may recall that I announced that the lesson that I plan to preach tonight, I titled it, Jeremiah, You Lied. Now that may sound like a rather strange title and accusation, for we surely do not remember Jeremiah or do not think of him as, as a liar, do we? Jeremiah was one of those great prophets of God who lived and spoke to the people of Israel really the, the tribe of Judah by this point in history, during its midnight hour, the last 40 years, you might say, of the kingdom of God known as Judah, then fell in 586 B.C. Jeremiah prophesied that if they did not repent, that they would be taken into captivity. In fact, he even named who would come, that it would be Nebuchadnezzar, called God's servant that Babylon, the Chaldeans, would come down and, and indeed Judah would be overrun. In fact, he also predicted or prophesied that they would be in captivity, captivity some 70 years, which really proved to be true, all of that. We do not think of Jeremiah, therefore, as a liar, do we? In fact, he, he was a man who was despised by those who were false prophets. There were many false prophets during that period of history, and one of the reasons Jeremiah was not listened to was that there were so many other men who claimed to have a vision, who have heard the word of the Lord, who said, peace, peace. The temple is here. The temple is in Jerusalem. Surely God wouldn't take us into captivity. Surely the temple would not be destroyed was their message. And you know, according to human reasoning, that sounded rather legitimate. Jeremiah, therefore, was despised. Jeremiah, even at one point, was cast into a deep well as, as though they would seek his life. It had not been for a Gentile, Ebenezer, who came and with others helped pull him up out of it. He was a man who, who really we describe often as, as the weeping prophet. Now, that doesn't mean that Jeremiah just felt sorry for himself. First and foremost, Jeremiah wept from the Lord's point of view. In fact, the book starts early on by saying, what has God done that has made you forget him? Why would you turn your hearts away from the Lord? He's only brought blessings to those who served him. He wept from Judah's point of view, God's people, for he knew the captivity that was about to come if they did not repent. And, and because he felt sorry for their future, he wept in their behalf. But also he wept for himself. At one point in his life, he got to the point that he, he wished virtually that he had never been born. I often say to every Bible teacher, woman or man, if you've ever felt somewhat discouraged in trying to teach your friends the Word of God and you've had them reject you, if you've felt a little bit down, you need to read the book of Jeremiah. That you need to keep on teaching there was a time when Jeremiah would say, I, I've just quit, I'm going to stop doing this, no one wants it. But he said, I, I could not. It was like fire in my bosom. I had to speak the word of God. Surely a man that we remember like this, why would, we, why would he ever be described as a liar? And yet, he was indeed accused of lying. You have your Bible, and I hope you do. I'd like to encourage you to open with me to the reading found in the 43rd chapter of the book of Jeremiah. And we're going to read quite a bit tonight, so I hope you have brought your Bibles and that you'll be able to follow along. I think you'll find the lesson far more interesting if you can do just that. The accusation, though, is found in, in chapter 43, in the first three verses. The Scripture says, As soon as Jeremiah, whom the Lord their God had sent, had finished telling all the people all the words of the Lord their God, that is, all these words, Azariah the son of Hoshiah and Johanan the son of Korea and all the arrogant men said to Jeremiah, you are telling a lie. The Lord our God has not sent you to say you are not to enter Egypt to reside there, 
But Baruch, the son of Neriah, is inciting you against us to give us over into the hand of the Chaldeans so they will put us to death or exile us to Babylon. Now, of course, the story begins long before this. And maybe in order to understand really what they're saying and why they're calling the liar, it's best for us to go back just a chap couple of chapters. And, and there you read that even what Jeremiah had been prophesying for some 40 years had come to pass by this point in history. In chapter 39, in fact, is there is told how that indeed the Babylonians had overtaken Jerusalem. And indeed, God's people were taken captive. The temple itself had been destroyed. Indeed, it was a sad time in the history of God's people. But there were many, while many were taken away, there were a few who were left in that area. But Jeremiah had been given the privilege of staying behind. Nebuzaradan, who was the, the commander in charge under Nebuchadnezzar's orders, had told Jeremiah, even though he had been captured and in chains, he was going to be loosed because no doubt the word had come to Nebuchadnezzar that this man Jeremiah had even called him by name and had predicted that they ought to give up because if they didn't, they would surely be destroyed anyway, that Nebuchadnezzar was God's servant. And therefore, having heard this and knowing that Jeremiah was urging the king or, or, or Zedekiah to give over, he then instructed Nebuzaradan, you let Jeremiah choose if he wants to come in peace and live in Babylon or if he wants to stay back here in Jerusalem, he has the choice. Faithful to God's remnant that was left, Jeremiah remained in Jerusalem. But also Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar, his commander, appointed a man named Gedaliah to be in charge over this remnant that was left around Jerusalem. Gedaliah was the man. But there was another man named Ishmael who was rather jealous, it seems. Ishmael was of the royal seed. And therefore he set out and did, in fact, accomplish assassinating Gedaliah. Now the very one who was in charge, you may say, put in charge by the Babylonians, has now been put to death by his own fellow brethren. And those few who were left became very fearful. Their thought was, we better go down to Egypt. I mean, just as sure as the word gets back to, to, to Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadnezzar, you know, they'll certainly come back and, and will just wipe the rest of us out or take us all in chains back to Babylon. But if we'll go down to Egypt, there we will be protected by Pharaoh and all will be well. But, you know, first, let's see what Jeremiah said. You know, after 30 years of being rejected, finally they say, well, let's go see. Maybe he is a man of God and he does know the word of the Lord. And so sets the stage for our lesson tonight. Look at chapter 42, in fact. When the scripture says in chapter 42, beginning verses 1 through 6, the scripture says, and remember, this is the time that Jerusalem has been destroyed, a time when they're saying, we, we should go to Egypt, but first, let's ask Jeremiah. Chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Then all the commanders of the forces, Johanan the son of Korea, Jezaniah the son of Hoshiah, and all the people, both small and great, approached and said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please, let our petition come before you, and pray for us to the Lord your God, that is, for all this remnant, because we are left but a few out of many, as your own eyes now see us, that the Lord your God may tell us the way in which we should walk and, and the thing that we should do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I've heard you. Behold, I am going to pray to the Lord your God in accordance with your words. And I will tell you the whole message which the Lord will answer you. And I will not keep back a word from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with the whole message with which the Lord your God will send you to us, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant. We will listen to the voice of the Lord our God to whom we are sending you so that it may go well with us when we listen to the voice of the Lord our God. I pause right here and ask, could you ask for a better statement than that? I mean, that just sounds like just as it ought to be. Jeremiah, we think we ought to go to Egypt, but we'll ask you first of all to find out from the Lord. You pray to the Lord. And whatever message he says, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, we will do it. 
We'll do exactly what the message is. Great at this point, isn't it? But let's read further, beginning in verse 7, verse 7 through 12. <coughs> now at the end of ten days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Then he called for Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces that were with him, and, and for all the people, both small and great, and said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition before him. If you will indeed stay in this land, then I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you, for I will relent concerning the calamity that I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you are now fearing. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you to save you and deliver you from his hand. I will show you compassion so that he will have compassion on you and restore you to your own soul. That's a pretty simple and direct answer, isn't it? Ten days later, he comes back, and the Lord has promised, if you will but stay, you'll be blessed. In fact, I will even soften the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, and he'll, he will bless you. He, he will bring good things on you. Don't go to Egypt. It's real clear. But there's an either or in this. As you begin with verse 13, but if you are going to say we will not stay in the land so as not to listen to the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go to the land of Egypt where we will not see war or hear the sound of a trumpet or hunger for bread, and we will stay there. Then in that case, listen to the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if you really set your mind to enter Egypt and go in to reside there, then the sword which you are afraid of will overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine about which you are anxious will follow closely after you there in Egypt, and you will die there. So all the men who set their mind to go to Egypt to reside there will die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, and they will have no survivors or refugees from the calamity that I'm going to bring on them. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and wrath have been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so my wrath will be poured out on you when you enter Egypt. And you will become a curse, an object of horror, an imprecation, and a reproach, and, and you will see this place no more. The Lord has spoken to you, O remnant of Judah. Do not go into Egypt. You should clearly understand that today I have testified against you. For you have only deceived yourselves. For it is you who sent me to the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us to the Lord our God, and whatever the Lord our God says, tell us so, and we will do it. So I have told you today, but you've not obeyed the Lord your God even in whatever he has sent me to tell you. Therefore, you should now clearly understand that you will die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence in the place where you wish to go to reside. There's an either or. If you'll stay here, God will bless you. If you go, you'll die of certainty. Everything you fear will happen in Egypt. But did you notice verse 20? Here's another case or matter in the, uh, that you ought to look at. In case you decide to go on, what you will prove is that you have only deceived yourself by even asking me. You will, in effect, prove that you didn't mean it when you said back earlier, whether it's pleasant, our ears are unpleasant, we'll do it. If you go on and reject what the Lord has said, all that does is just prove you didn't really mean what you promised. And so when we see what's happened here, they asked Jeremiah, please pray the Lord, Give us God's word. Sounds like a good petition. God's answer, if you go, you'll perish. What's their reaction? Well, we read it a moment ago. Let's read it one more time. That's not what we thought, Jeremiah, in chapter 43. As soon as Jeremiah, whom the Lord their God had sent, had finished telling all the people all the words of the Lord their God, that is, all these words, Azariah, the son of Hoshiah, and Hanan, the son of Kareah, and all the arrogant men. Notice who. The proud or arrogant men said to Jeremiah, you are telling a lie. The Lord our God has not sent you to say you're not to enter Egypt to reside there, but Baruch, the son of Neriah, is inciting you against us to give us over into the hand of the Chaldeans so they will put us to death or exile us to Babylon. 
So Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces and all the people did not obey the voice of the Lord to stay in the land of Judah. But Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces took the entire remnant of Judah who had, who had returned from all the nations to which they had been driven away in order to reside in the land of Judah, the men, the women, the children, the king's daughters, and every person that Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the bodyguard had left with Gedaliah, the son of the Hakim, and grandson of Shaphan, together with Jeremiah, the prophet, and Baruch, the son of Neriah. And they entered the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord and went in as far as Tathanus. What this says is, Jeremiah, what you said to us, that's not what we thought you would say. When we asked you to pray to the Lord and we said we'd do it whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, we really thought you are going to come back with what we thought we ought to do anyway. And we really meant that if you'd just given us the answer we thought you was going to give. But you know, Jeremiah, you, you didn't tell us what we thought. A and therefore, Jeremiah, you must have lied. That's surely in the Word of God. Surely God's going to agree with us. Surely God will agree that if we think it's safest and best to go to Egypt, that's what you would have come back with. Jeremiah, that must have been the word of Beirut. That must have been somebody else's word. And therefore, what did they do? They went to Egypt like they really wanted to do. And what did that prove? As verse 20, they deceived themselves. They just thought they really wanted God's word when they said, tell us and we'll keep it. Our question tonight is, have people changed? One of the points I've been making from the study of the prophets is that we look back at history and we see how history has a way of repeating itself. That we are really made up the same. We have the same emotions. We're together physically and, and, and in spirit, even as Adam and Eve. And, and though today we may have new gadgets, we have electric lights, and we have air conditioning, we have a lot of comforts today that maybe they didn't have in Jeremiah's day, but you know, the same issues that face us in choosing either to do God's will or not to do God's will, those are still the kind of choices men and women have to make in our day. And there may be those even today who would say, just tell us God's word, we'll keep it. But as certain as they began to read in God's word and find out that it's not what they thought it was going to say, they really don't keep it. And I ask, therefore, the audience tonight and every individual, we have to ask our own selves, what is our attitude toward God's Word? Are you really sure you want God's Word? Or is it that you want God to agree with what you think ought to be right? There's a lot of difference in those two. The difference in being able to say, Lord, thy will be done, I'll do it, whatever you say. Or, Lord, surely you'll agree with what I wanted. I tell you, in our world today, there are many who deceive themselves in rejecting his word. I've often said one of the best slogans the devil ever invented is the one of the more popular ones in the religious world today. It really doesn't matter what you believe, just so you're honest. Ever heard that one before? It really doesn't matter what you believe. Now, you know, I say the devil invented a, never invented a better slogan than that. You look at the real natural consequence. If it doesn't matter what you believe, you come to any verse in his Bible. If you don't like that page, let's just tear it out. It won't matter. But that's such a popular preaching among many denominational preachers today because they don't really want to get into the fact that there is a, a lot of error being taught today. Obviously, division exists in the religious world. A and many offer conflicting, contradicting doctrines, and, and, but we want peace and love, and so how do we cover it over? Well, it really doesn't matter what you believe is the words that are said. But it does matter with God what we do. And we only deceive ourselves if we think that, that it really doesn't matter. We can go our own way. Oh, there are those who say, you know, you know the grace of God. God loves us, and, and we're saved by grace. And, and, and as though grace just covers everything, that means we really don't have to do anything. Grace means undeserved favor. And, and so God loves us, and by His grace we're saved. And that kind of reasoning sounds good until we begin to read some scriptures like, for example, even in Titus chapter 2, and there in verse 11 through 12, the Scripture describes the grace of God that bringeth salvation, hath appeared to all men. Then notice the language, teaching us. The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, 
we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That within itself says there are some things we must do. If the grace of God and the word of God's grace is found here, if it teaches us, and this is the only way it can teach us, and we're walking in sin, it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that's repentance, isn't it? We've got to stop that. And therefore that we ought to do some things to walk soberly and righteously and godly. That's walking by faith. It is to take his word and, and obey. The grace of God teaches obedience. And if, in fact, we learn the importance of obeying God's word, then we also learn that it really does matter what we do. Passages like in 1 John, when the apostle is writing even to Christians, he says, hereby we do know that we know him. I've had sometimes people say, how do you know that you really know the Lord? Well, the apostle, more often than any other book, says, here's how we know. You want to know that you know God? Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. By this we know. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. That's pretty strong language. To call a man a liar, but that's the inspired message from the Apostle John. The man who says, I know him, but doesn't obey his word is a liar. The only way you know that you know God is to do God's word. In fact, <coughs> in 2 John, in verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine hath both the Father and the Son. We need to take heed to God's word. We can do like the Jews of our text and say, you lied. When in reality, what that will cause for us is lost salvation. We need to really mean what we say. I want God's word. And that's why we ought to demand of those who preach the word and we give heed to their message that, that, that they follow the instruction that even the Apostle Paul in writing to the young evangelist Timothy when he said, preach the word. Be innocent in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come that men will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And we've turned aside from the truth and we turn unto fables. Not only was that true in Paul's day, that still remains true in our own time. That there are some who turn aside their ears from the truth. One of the most fearful passages to me is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I say fearful. There are a lot of fearful passages. You know, you can talk about hell, and that ought to be enough to frighten anyone who wants to reject God. But, but, but I think this passage in 2 Thessalonians is more frightening because it talks about people who don't want to receive the truth. God won't force you to receive truth. God won't force you to go to hell. He won't force you to go to heaven. It's your choice and my choice. This passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks how that, that there are those who might hear the word but turn their heart away from it. They may be deceived. He says those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. There are people today who say, oh, I just, and they pat themselves on the chest, I just feel in my heart that I'm saved and, and, and I'm satisfied. Let's not talk about it. Wrong attitude. My brethren, all of us as well must have the spirit to keep an open Bible and an open mind. Never get to the point that you are closed in your own attitude that you will not search the truth. It may be that you need to make some changes. And as we talk to our neighbors and friends, let's urge upon them. If I'm in error, please show me where, and we'll make changes. Keep that honest attitude with an open mind and an open Bible. Do not close your heart, lest you be deceived and believe a lie in the place of truth. You may be sincere about it, but you'll still be lost if you follow error. I say that's a fearful voice, uh, a verse if we deceive ourselves. Indeed, we know it need to have that attitude as we heard before, God said it. That settles it. I believe it. 
That needs to be the spirit that we have. If God's word speaks it, then we ought to have the spirit that says, that's all I need. I'm going to obey it because the grace of God teaches me to do his will. Are you really sure you want God's word? Let's put that to the test a little bit before we close. The attitude that says, give me God's word, that settles it. You know, one of the popular doctrines in our world today is just say the sinner's prayer and you can be saved. And there are those who say, well, do you really think baptism is necessary for salvation? We're saved by grace. We don't have to do any work. And I tell you, it's a very popular doctrine. Not only is it popular in the sense that it's preached a lot, but it's also satisfying to the people who want to just sort of say, yeah, I'm going to raise my hand. I'd like to go to heaven. And give me those words to say, and Christ will come into my heart, and then I can keep on living like I've always lived. That isn't God's word. Have you ever remembered reading in the Scripture any time where an alien sinner was told, just say the sinner's prayer and you'll be saved? Not one time can you find that in the book of God. But it's popularly preached today. The fact is, I ask you, would Jeremiah have lied if he had quoted Acts 2 and verse 38? Where when that first gospel sermon was preached on the day of Pentecost, Peter with the apostles had, had preached, of course, how that Jesus fulfilled even the prophecies of his death and of his resurrection, quoting from the Psalms. And then as he came to the climax of his lesson, there were those who cried out, what shall we do? Convicted in their heart, pricked in their heart, they asked what to do to be saved. Now, at this point, they were men who believed. They've heard the message. They were pricked in their heart. Peter didn't say, well, just say the sinner's prayer, did he? You read Acts 2 and verse 38, he said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized. Why isn't that popularly preached today? Well, it's not the message that a lot of people want to hear. It's not an easy thing. In fact, it takes a humble attitude to be immersed in water because God said it. Some people say, well, why is that necessary? I sometimes say, well, you know, if God commanded it, that's all that makes it necessary. If God said do it, that ought to be sufficient. But I believe Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 gives us a really an answer as to why, what's really happening in baptism. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, the apostle in effect said, Don't you know that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are married, buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When people ask me, why do you believe we must be baptized to be saved? I used to say, because God commanded it. That's sufficient. That's right. But I've begun more to say now, because I believe it takes the blood of Christ to be saved. And you know, I find most people agree with that one. Even people who don't believe baptism is essential at this point will say, well, yes, we're redeemed by his blood. The, the scripture clearly says that, Ephesians 1 verse 7. Well, how do you reach the blood? You ever remember reading a passage that you pray into his blood? That you believe into his blood? That you repent into his blood? His blood was shed in his death. And Romans 6, 3 and 4 says we're buried by baptism into his death. That's where you reach the blood, and that's why it is for the remission of sins. You know, there's one place in the Bible I would have to say that it illustrates a person who said a sinner's prayer, but he wasn't saved in it. It's the story of Saul of Tarsus. Do you remember the story of Saul? In Acts chapter 9, first of all, it's told us, again in Acts 22 and again in Acts 26 from his own point of view. He was on the road to Damascus, ready to, to bring Christians bound back to Jerusalem to persecute them. He was opposed to Christ, thought he was an imposter. But on the way, he saw the vision of the Lord, and for the first time understood Jesus really is the Son of God. For the first time, he came face to face with truth. And his reaction, he had that honest heart that said, What will you have me to do, Lord? Go into the city, and there it shall be told thee what thou must do. Do you remember the story in Acts chapter 9 as he goes on into Damascus? In Acts 9 verse 11, the, the Lord appears to Ananias, the preacher who's going to go tell him what he needs to do. And the Lord instructs Ananias, you'll find him praying. Three days this man fasted and prayed 
I'll tell you, if there was ever a man who knew he was lost and needed forgiveness and who was praying to God, there's your example of it. But in his own words in Acts 22, he said that when Ananias came to him, he said, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and do what? Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It wasn't the water that washes away sins, it's the blood of Christ. And that's why in baptism, the sins are being washed away. Yes, he's prayed, and I don't tell a sinner, never pray, but I do tell a sinner, prayer of itself is not the means of reaching the blood of Christ. If you pray, you need to be praying, Lord, help me to understand truth, help me to have the courage to obey truth when I see it. But recognize the grace of God teaches us to obey his word. And so, as the apostles answered men who asked, what shall we do? Repent, if you believe. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Do you really want God's word? Is that really what you're seeking? Is salvation by the blood of Christ. Or would you say, well, I, you know, that's just not the way I think about it. That's just not what I understand. And I just don't see why, which way do we go? Show me the word and I'll keep it. Or, Lord, surely, surely you won't demand something that I can't understand why. I wish that would be all that we'd have to say that troubles us sometime in the religious world. In fact, I'd have to say even among my own brethren, there are some other issues that we, we sometimes have to, to, to face. The, the matter and the question about instrumental music. Y you know, among churches of Christ for years, we're known, it seems, among the people of the religious world that, that when we come in to worship God, we sing and praise. I've often ask, had people ask me the question, oh, why don't you have music there? And my answer is, we had music. Wasn't it wonderful music tonight? And as we gather together, we sing and make melody in their heart to the Lord. We don't use instrumental music because that is an addition to what God's Word says. And I would like to say that, well, my brethren have been pretty, pretty united in making that same kind of plea, that, that in fact we worship God in song. Recently, in fact, a few months ago, I was given three CDs of a sermon or sermons that was preached by a man who calls himself a gospel preacher, Rick Atchley, of the Richland Hills Church in Fort Worth, Texas, in which he used three sermons to justify, at least in his attempt, that instrumental music really was all right in worship. And also, to have the Lord's Supper on Saturday evening. That they would have a supper on, the Lord's Supper on Saturday evening, and, and, and in that service have instrumental music. And of course, he thought he needed to have at least some scripture for it. I, I guess from one point of view, I'm glad he tried to say, here's the scripture for it. But he misapplied and misused scripture. And it wasn't a new argument. It's arguments that have been made over and over again through others who've tried to justify Two basic reasons. He said there, you know, the Greek word that is translated sing, or in Ephesians 5, 19, make melody, is this word psalo. Or there's also from it the root of it, psalmos. And, and actually those words really carried and included the instrument, the mechanical instrument. And therefore, his conclusion was that justified it. In fact, his second reason was you know, the Bible doesn't say not to use instrumental music. It doesn't say the word only, sing only. And therefore, we have some liberty in this matter. Those were his two basic reasons. I'd have to tell you, first of all, surely he's intelligent enough to go back and look at history and study of words. The truth is, there was a time in which those words, psalmos or psalo, did include instrumental music. Words, though, both in Greek as well as in English, have a way of changing meaning. Anybody here have the King James Version translation, use the King James Version? You probably all, many of the older ones have, at least in time past, if you don't now. And we come to a word like conversation. Today we use the word conversation. We're talking about talking. We, we have a conversation with one another. But then we all have to explain, don't we, to our friends, well, in the King James Version, it's translated nearly 400 years ago, and the word conversation has changed its meaning. Today, it means a 
talking to one another. But, you know, back then, it carried the idea of a manner of life. And we do that with several other expressions in the King James Version. That's one of the reasons there are these newer translations that try to bring words up to date to the way they're used now. Well, the same way with the word solo and psalmos. By the time of the Lord Jesus Christ and the church was established, and there are many scholars who will, clear, will prove this point, that by that time the verb solo did not include the use of instruments of music. The word had changed its meaning. And you know one of the strongest proofs for that? Five times in the New Testament you'll find the word, only five times. In Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Two times in 1 Corinthians, where he says, I will sing with the Spirit, I will sing with the understanding also. In James 5 and verse 13, is any merry, let him sing praises unto the Lord. Now, those verses have been translated by hundreds of scholars of the Greek language. Even in the newer translations, not one of them will say, sing and play. Now, I'll tell you, these are scholars. That's how we have our translation. We trust them to know the Greek language. Now, the truth is, in Ephesians 5, 19, instead of being translated, sing there, it is translated, make melody. And the reason for it is that you have two different Greek words in that verse, singing and making melody. The first word, singing, is from another Greek word, adantes, singing. And there was useless to say singing and singing. In fact, the phrase with it, singing and making melody where? Or with what? In your heart. It isn't a word that justifies the use of instrumental music. If we look at the scripture and we do what they did, at least as inspired by the Lord, they're singing. Why add anything to that? Well, now, you know, he argued, well, it didn't say sing only. Does that justify? Can we add anything we want in our worship if it doesn't say the word only? I believe most of us will understand as we come to the Lord's Day on Sunday morning, we partake of the unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. Did Jesus have to say, now, unleavened bread only? Or fruit of the vine only? What if Sunday morning you got here, you brethren, and wherever you worship, and we have unleavened bread and fruit of the vine and chocolate chip cookies? I love them. But you'd say, wait a minute, Bob, that's just not what goes on the Lord's table. That's an addition. Well, the Lord didn't say only. He didn't say not to use chocolate chip cookies. And you could go all of wherever you want to with that. You understand the point. What he said, we must not change. We must not add to. We must do what he authorized. And that being sufficient. I in fact, the scripture would tell us that silence has a way of forbidding additions. I in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14, where the writers there talking about Jesus as a priest after the, after the order of Aaron, first of all, the Levitical priesthood, and then after the order of Melchizedek. And he says, you know, Jesus could not have been a priest on earth anyway because he was of the tribe of Judah, of which Moses said nothing. When Moses, by God's order, was giving the direction of who would be priest, he didn't have to say, now, not Judah. He just simply said of the tribe of Levi. And that was sufficient. And the whole point and the argument is silence forbids any change or addition to it. And it's in that kind of thinking. If God said it, that ought to be sufficient. Would we say you lie when you said sing and make melody in your heart? Or we would just do what God said without addition, without subtraction, without any change? Well, well what about observing the Lord's Supper on Saturday? You know, he tried to justify that because he said, you know, between 5 to 7 p.m. was the most unscheduled time. And, and therefore, we can reach more people, and we want to reach more people. That's really why we want instrumental music, because we want to reach more people. And, and our young people are turning away if we don't have instrumental music. And, and, you know, we can just reach more if we have the Saturday evening service as well. Logic, man's point of view, but... Would Jeremiah have lied if he'd quoted 
Acts 20 and verse 7. Here, here's the example of the New Testament disciples. Upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. Paul preached unto them. Why change the day? Why just simply try to follow the crowd or reach what people want? You remember last night from Hosea, we pointed out in chapter 4, where he said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then in verse 9, he said, What's happening with the priests? Like people, like priests. The people are ignorant of God's word because the priests haven't taught God's word. They've taught what the people wanted to hear. And my people are destroyed as a result of that. I say to you, when preachers today begin to preach like that, there will be those even now who will be destroyed for their lack of knowledge. Let's do God's will and God's way. We know they met on the first day of the week. Passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2 illustrate that very point in describing even when they would lay by in store, make contribution upon the first day of the week. Let each one of you lay by in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. We know that was a common time of assembling. It was the day on which our Lord arose from the grave. It is certainly the day on which we ought to remember his death, burial, and resurrection as we partake of the Lord's Supper. But one more point. Let's raise the question. If showtime worship appeals, can we do this? Showtime worship? What's that? Somebody might say, well, I'll tell you what. That's an appeal in our religious world today. There are many people who can go to an assembly and and it's almost, as someone described, it's kind of like a, well, a second-rate Branson. <laughs> I thought that was a very good illustration. You know, you want to show, it's entertaining. And there are those who have, you know, their choirs and their rock bands, and they have things that really are entertaining to some people. You, you find some churches that they offer traditional worship and contemporary worship. Not quite sure where you get that in the Bible, those two different kinds of worship, but that's what's offered today. And what they're doing is trying to really make it down to the appeal of the masses and let's, let's make it like the people want it rather than thinking about what God wants. I'll tell you, my beloved, when we come to worship, you might leave the assembly and say, well, what would you think about that worship tonight? That's the wrong question, really. It ought to be, what do you think God thought of that worship tonight? We haven't come here tonight to be entertained. I hope that's not the mood and attitude. I'm sure you wouldn't have come out on a Monday night if that were your reason. We've come to praise God. And we ought to remember that He is holy and that we need to bow our hearts in reverence. And when we finish, it's not a time that we clap and we're glad because, oh, it was so entertaining and we got so much out of it. It ought to be, Lord, what did you think of it? I've come to praise Him. I in fact, would Jeremiah lie? If indeed he were to say that 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 5, as living stones you built up into a spiritual house or for spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. How about quoting to us what the church is? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a or the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. What's the church? I tell you, whatever you want to think of as the church, think of it as that which Christ paid for with his blood. And whatever is the mission and work of the church ought to be supported by what he shed his blood for. What did he shed his blood for? Salvation of souls. And that's why passages like 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, the the church of the Lord, the pillar and ground of truth. That's what it is. It's mission to save souls and to keep them saved. Evangelism and, and, and edification. And yes, there is benevolence of, of those who are saved. But it's works around salvation of souls. Not being entertained. Not just having a, a good time. Not with a social gospel that so many are offering in this day and time. They've lost sight of the church really being the pillar and ground of truth. The church in Orlando has a restaurant. You can buy Starbucks coffee there, and, and after, after service on Sunday morning, you can buy your meal there for your family. Can the church say that's really, that's what Christ died for, for his church to be involved in things like that? Yes, the church at Corinth was having some problems, and, and, and indeed they had problems about the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11. He said, don't you have houses to eat and to drink in? There's a time and a place for brethren to get together. But when we come to worship God, and when we talk about the church as such, its mission, its work, 
and how its funds ought to be spent, it has to do with saving souls. That's the purpose for the death of Christ. And that's the purpose and mission of those who love him and want to serve him. Oh, yes, indeed, we ought to ask, do you really want God's word? Let's not deceive ourselves by rejecting his word, saying, oh, yeah, give us God's word, but, oh, that's not what we thought you were going to say, Jeremiah. Let's have an attitude, give me God's word. If God said it, that settles it. I believe it. I'll keep it. Take your hymn books out. Turn to the song that's been selected for our invitation tonight. Perhaps there's one tonight here in this audience who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe your heart is so turned that you want to obey him tonight. Baptistry's filled. Clothing is prepared. All it takes is a heart that's willing and ready to obey. If you believe Jesus to be the Son of God, why not repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be buried into his death that his blood may wash away your sins. We bid you come even now as we stand and while we sing this song.